background of uh, uh, comments and presentation with uh, Professor Suzanne Kasha from Australia, a great teacher of history of criminology. It's great to this the entire world. So, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, event. And uh, I think you might think that mine is just a kind of uh, going on from what uh, Manuel said. However, I come from a different angle. I'm a comparative criminologist, what Manuel is also. And my question from which I started was, is big picture criminology policy relevant? That is, can comparative criminology contribute to evidence-based policies? And if yes, what could be the contribution? What would this contribution look like? So the benchmark, of course, that I thought of was experimental criminology. And this changed the question to, can big picture criminology be as useful as experimental designs and random control trials in addressing crime and justice problems across the globe and deliver tools for preventing violence and or corruption or improving, uh, for example, prison conditions. Comparative and cross-national research is mainly identified with the big picture. Um, this term is, was coined by Richard Rosenfeld. And it is thus identified with efforts to find explanations of different crime levels or criminal justice practice, uh, practices rather than figuring out how to reduce crime and improving justice. And for many criminologists, it epitomizes uh, criminology as a descriptive and observational science. And Larry compares this type of criminology to astronomy and proposes that criminology should move to experimental and medical models of science. And indeed, interventionists, uh, interventions are seemingly impossible in this area of astronomy. However, many successful quasi-experimental quasi approaches in, in, in astronomy and enhanced observational techniques have very much contributed to the success and the outstanding successes of astronomy. Not dissimilar to astronomy, comparative and mostly observational criminology has the potential to question established worldviews. We know all Galileo and the theories that were taken for granted. And one such, uh, for example, one such assumption in our field is that the rich get richer and the poor get prison. And this is established in manifold theoretical and empirical, also empirical accounts on the relationship between inequality and imprisonment. So the idea is the more inequality in a society, the higher is the imprisonment right. And that has been promoted, for example, by Wilkinson and Pickett in 2009. Actually, I could not reproduce their figures. I don't know where they got them from. Uh, so I tested this hypothesis and this idea, and I found that it was neither true on a global scale, it was not true on a regional scale, that is, comparing re uh, within regions, it was not true. And I tested also different mechanisms, how this could be about with different indicators of inequality, for example, gender inequality or power differentials and so on. Nothing, there was nothing, literally nothing. And in contrast, I found that for Latin American countries, poverty and inequality had been gone considerably down over the past 20 years and imprisonment <laughs> had considerably gone out. Now explain this. So um, I also found, for example, in other comparative research that trust in police and justice, uh, for trust in police and justice, democracies do not outperform other regime types. And actually, they don't differ from autocracies. Perhaps an example for Jamaica, which are um, where Singapore is the autocracy and Jamaica still the uh, democracy. So these observational results clearly question what criminologists can take for granted, like astronomy shattered a lot of worldviews. 
So as Dan and Rob, Dan Nagin and Rob Sampson advocate the analysis and evaluation of system-wide intervention, they clearly venture into this field of comparative research and evidence-based policy. And I think this is a timely and necessary move. And I also think that the potential of such comparative cross-national analysis have remained quite underexplored and undervalued and a neglected, quite valid source for knowledge about crime and justice policies. If we contrast that, for example, with political science or health and developmental development economics, to which uh, Dan Nagin and Rob Sampson refer quite a bit in uh, their uh, argument, here, in this field, comparative research is seen as a foundation for evidence-based policies and its policy relevance is not really disputed. Early on, even in the 1960s, political scientists asked whether comparison can be regarded as the social scientist's equivalent of the natural scientist's laboratory, and the comparative method an adequate substitute for experimentation. The answer was that comparison was only an imperfect substitute not a perfect one. But its limitations were not necessarily disabling for the person, for the purpose. And I think Manuel has just shown that very nicely. Today, for example, the UN or World Bank and NGOs extensively, extensively use comparative methods in reports and also in policy making. And themes range widely. For example, how can you prevent coup, coups? You restrain your military to the role of women's education and children's mortality, that is famous rustling factfulness, or from levels of corruption uh, for health outcomes for mothers and children. So I found, for example, for Nigeria, a decline in corruption and simultaneously a decline in mother's mortality. Of course, there is no causal relationship, but what it indicates is that there are some system-wide institutional changes that obviously have an impact on both. So we find quite a number of examples where such comparative st uh, studies have questioned existing policies of development and also changed the flow of investments. So the com what, uh, what do comparative criminologists have at their hand? They have a natural laboratory existing among the societies and governments of nearly 200 countries today. And this is the question that Manuel raised. They even have more laboratories. Um, they become more numerous if we include subnational levels, if we include subnational spaces, and for example, if we go to cities and compare cities. And together, these provide an immensely and incredibly rich data set for exploring what kind of policies work, what does not, and what is promising. So presently, for example, urban spaces and local, local governments emerge as one of the most promising natural laboratories from which to learn. As comparative criminology goes experimental, its basic logic follows the experimental approach. However, there are clear limitations now. These are the limitations that we struggle with. And um, so there are three types of limitations. This includes the non-manipulability of variables, the long durée of impact of policies, and what I call the institutional coagulation and the simultaneous convergence and divergence of trends. So one of the major factor, factors affecting the relevance of comparative criminology is that we have a large number of variables that are used and that are not easily manipulable uh, or not at all. And this is pretty much like astronomy is. We can't manipulate that. <laughs> Somebody else seems to do that. And um, for example, levels of inequality are good predictors of violence. However, 
hard to manipulate. And even we do not know exactly the causal mechanisms that relate the two. Or for example, trust between people is important, um, important cultural and social resource of societies, but we hardly, perhaps a very hard thing uh, to change through policy intervention. Um, predictors in the distant past are still powerful. For example, uh, one of the best predictors of contemporary corruption is levels of 19th century education, as was found out. And that's a long impact time. And uh, obviously, something else happens in between. And finally, change and trends do not always neatly coincide. Even if we have the same downward trend in crime and violence, if these trends are widely shared, as Gary Leffrey found in 2015, the driving factors often are not shared. So we have a lot of variety <coughs> here. I would like briefly to talk about what I call institutional coagulation. And here we have a seduction of counterfactual worlds. Institutional co coagulation means that there is a convergence of institutions into a compre comprehensive and rather well-fitted pattern where they are reinforcing each other and their impact. And this seems to me at the core of these problems. Actually, this type of institutional coagulation is seductive as it presents us with beautifully counterfactual worlds. A widely used pair is actually Jamaica and Singapore, that also Manuel used. Uh, the political scientist Boo Rothstein unpicks it. He looks at exactly the same curves that <coughs> Manuel showed, of course not for violence, but for other outcomes. And um, in, in mainly uh, citizens' well-being and so on. And he checks diligently, he checks whether cultural and geographical location plays a role. It does not, as both countries are situated in quite diverse regions and not bound by their location as, for example, other countries who would be in Western Europe or would be in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the whole developmental context actually binds these countries into certain patterns. Neither does democracy, as he finds out to my chagrin, and, <laughs> um, because, um, and democracy can be ruled out as a beneficial factor. Authoritarian Singapore develops beneficial institutional patterns while democratic Jamaica does not. However, this institutional coagulation, which actually starts, as Manuel showed, in the 1960s, sets both on a trajectory with strong self-reinforcing mechanisms that drive them apart in a rather short period of time. And um, so, but we do not know, Manuel showed us some potential uh, causal mechanisms that might be behind this, but of course, this whole institutional pattern and how it reinforces itself also then has all the other outcomes of well-being, health, child mortality, and so on that Manuel showed us and how they differ now. My other example is corruption control in Ghana, and this is another problem of system-wide intervention. Um, a system-wide policy intervention to reduce low-level corruption by police in Ghana demonstrates the pitfalls and problems of institutional contexts when a rule changer, policy as a rule changer, as uh, Dan Egan and Rob Sampson say, is introduced in 2010. What was this rule changer? The Ghana government implemented a single spine salary structure for all police officers and which doubled their salaries. And the idea was that doubling salaries would reduce the low level widespread corruption in this country. All the other countries surrounding Ghana did not do that, nor was this done for other um, public offices in Ghana. So the police was the only institution that had this amazing <coughs> salary rise. So what happened then? 
what was found uh, in a very, uh, very, very good observational uh, survey, um, uh, survey analysis was that the increase of bribes taken in Ghana was significantly increased. So police took more bribes, bribes and they took it more often. And the big question, why? So this was is in transborder lorry traffic. So why does this happen? And Justice Tankiwe and I did a survey study on corruption intentions in Ghana. Uh, and we wanted to look into this counter, completely counterproductive and unexpected uh, impact. And we found that it was <coughs> due to specific cultural institutions originating from allegiances to and status gains within tribal and kinship networks, where the higher salary of policemen obliged them to contribute more there. So they also needed higher bribes. Actually, unpacking this causal mechanisms obviously needed an additional research and methods. And uh, by the way, Foltz and his colleague mention our solution in a footnote as a comment of a taxi driver who gave them the right hint what it was about. Briefly, a path forward. We all from astronomy to medicine and criminology and political science share one problem, that inference is not causality. So we need to transform inferences into explanations and therefore find the specific causal mechanism that leads to the outcome in experiments and equally in system-wide interventions or policy comparisons of larger systems. Thus, as we can learn from a study of mass extinction of dinosaurs, a huge impact, by the way, obviously, uh, we need what is called fair causal comparison. That is, we need to have compare rival hypotheses and carefully collect evidence for these hypotheses. We may accept, actually, that the general, this general impact as a cause or hotspot policing as a cause, and still can doubt the actual causal processes until we have more and better measurement, as it happened in astronomy. And as there are multiple ways to engage in this type of fair causal comparison, I like the fairness in that, this renders methodological pluralism more credible than met methodological unity. And in, this, in his comparison of Jamaica and Singapore, Bu Rothstein engages in such a kind of exercise of causal, fair causal comparisons. In preparation for this uh, seminar, I went back to Paul Firearms Against Method. It is much less an anarchist's cookbook than often so thought. He actually directs our attention to scientific practices experimental and observational. And he comes to the conclusion that we need a plurality of such practices. And he shows how often several practices were involved in big breakthroughs in astronomy or even specific type of practices were ignored in favor of a kind of less clear methodology. So I think at this, uh, this is a plea, I fear, for having methodological plurality. Thank you very much. <laughs>